The Hedge of Thorns is a little book about a young man who wrote a short testimony about himself in 1611 while living in Carlisle, England. This little work was first published in England and appears to be the production of a pious writer from the 18th century as a relation of facts. The young man who recorded the text died before completing his testimony. Upon finding this remarkable record, the editor appears to have first-hand knowledge of the events surrounding this unique story. The Hedge of Thorns helps children and adults understand and gives an example of how God protects us when we don't think He is. This book is a powerful lesson helping the young and the old trust in God's goodness over us. If you don't know a vocabulary word, Leave a comment below and I will clarify the word for you. I hope you enjoy this text. The Hedge of Thorns, 1611 by John Carroll. The Hedge of Thorns, Chapter 1 My name is John Carroll. I was born not very far distant from the city of Carlisle in a lone cottage situated on the southern side of a woody upland. My father was by trade a gardener, and was employed in various gentlemen's families in the neighborhood. He was also the parish clerk, a man much beloved in the country, being endowed with a mind as lovely as the flowers which he was employed to cultivate, for he was, as I have no doubt, early chosen of God, precious in his sight, and enabled by the power of his Holy Spirit to overcome in a great measure, the original depravity of his nature, and to seek those things that are honest and just, lovely and of good report. Our house was exceedingly old, and so low that the thatch at the back of it sloped nearly down to the side of the bank which rose above it. It was, however, roomy, and at the front was a porch of carved wood, with a bench on each side and a space between, sufficiently large to admit my mother's spinning wheel. The cottage stood in a large garden, where, besides every kind of useful vegetable, were a beautiful wood vine, which had crept all over the porch, and two rows of flowers on each side of the straight path which led to the garden wicket. There were snowdrops and crocuses in their season, marigolds, daffodils, pinks and pansies, violets and polyanthuses, and there grew the heart's ease in her fairest proportions. In this sweet retirement, under the care of my poor but pious parents, I was brought up, and every means were used, both of salutary chastisement and pious instruction, to train me up in the way I should go. My parents fulfilled their duty in an exemplary manner towards me. The greater, therefore, indeed, will be my condemnation, if in the end of days I am not found standing in my lot. The first event in my life which made any impression on me was the birth of my little sister, when I was in my fifth year. It was on a Sunday in the month of June. I was playing in the yard when my father, dressed in his best clothes, came smiling at me, bringing something carefully wrapped in my mother's red cloak, and stooping down, he opened the cloak and showed me my little sister. I remember kissing her soft hands, and from that time, my little sister became the object of my tenderest love and affection, and I waited with anxious expectation the happy time when I could take her on my Sabbath picnics near the castle of Hemlock Forest. She received at her birth the name of Annabella, the names of her two grandmothers, but I always called her my little Belle. At length, the long-wished-for period arrived when my little bell could play with me, and I was trusted to take her out into the garden and lane. Then what store of small shells and colored pebbles did I find for her, and how happy was I when I had taught her to repeat her first prayer. When little bell was about four years old, a school was opened in the village, nearly two and a half miles distant from us, 
by a person of small fortune, but a superior education, who, being a holy woman, was willing to give herself up to teaching the poor. The name of this excellent person was Miss Waring. She was considerably advanced in years, but she was still active. My parents were desirous that we should benefit by Miss Waring's instructions. My mother undertook extra washings in order to make up the money which might be laid out in schooling. Oh, how little do children know what parents sometimes endure and sacrifice for their sakes! Otherwise, they would bless every affliction which might lead them to show piety at home and to requite their parents, for that is good and acceptable to God. If I could go back and look my mother and father in the eyes, I would tenderly thank them in the earnest for my upbringing. It was late August when Belle joined me, and we were accordingly sent to school. At the distance it was considerable. As the distance was considerable, we used to carry our dinners with us in a basket, and did not return till the evening, when we always found our tender mother ready to give us our supper, and our dear father prepared to talk to us about God, and to hear me quote the Bible. We did not own a Bible, but Miss Warren had us memorize scriptures as we learned the alphabet. Little did I know how valuable those lessons would be. It wasn't long before father sold one of our cows, one of our two cows, in order to purchase our very own book of scriptures. There was rarely a day when I didn't see or hear father reading and sharing the word of God before bed. It was his one and only treasure that he coveted. To go to chapter two, leave a thumbs up and click the link below.